Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is ME2134, Introduction to Thermodynamics. So I'm Dr. Matthew Rice. I'm going to be your instructor for the semester. So we're going to spend the day going over introductory topics for the course, administrative stuff. So uh, topics, uh, administrative, administrative stuff, the syllabus, the procedure from when you have to fill out a request for excused absence, in other words, getting uh, excused from submitting uh, homework or doing exams. We're going to go over basic course administration. And then we're going to go over, for today, motivation for the course. Motivation for the course. Why are you taking thermodynamics? What's different about what you've done, what you're going to be doing here, as opposed to what you've done in basic physics? What's the motivation for doing thermodynamics? So those are the two topics for today. We're going to make kind of a short lecture, given that we have two more lectures this week. Um, so let's go over the syllabus here. So let's. Um, Go to the syllabus. So this is on Canvas under administration. You'll find the syllabus and we'll talk about the helpers, the request for absence form in just a moment. So uh, thermodynamics 2134, fall 2020. I'm Dr. Matthew Rice. My office is 114I Randolph. So if you go to the very back of the CAD lab, my office will be off to your left. Office hours, I think Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, given those are the days that we have lecture, uh, from 4.30 to 6, I actually 4.30 to 6.30, so that's two hours. I presume those of you that uh, have part-time jobs, hopefully that will be okay. Most of you should be around by 4.30, or at least not going to work till probably around 6 if you have a part-time job. So I think two hours, three days a week is gonna be sufficient. Um, textbooks, Fundamentals of Engineering Thermodynamics, eighth edition. That's the standard textbook for the course. However, as far as I'm concerned, um, you can also purchase the notes for the course, Thermodynamics, a short undergraduate introduction short undergraduate introduction. Copies of these are available outside my office. There's a, a pile of them on the metal shelves. They are $16 a piece, so they're very affordable, and they include all the material you will need for doing the course. They are the course notes, and they also include property tables. You'll be learning about this starting in a day or so determining properties of substance. So everything you need in the course will be provided in the notes as well as the main text. The notes I think is a, a lot more compact and goes at the material in a similar way as the lecture. Let's go over the grading here. Two tests, two midterms, 20% each, 40% for the course. And then we have homework which is 30%, I'm sorry, 25% for the homework, 5% for lecture quizzes. We will occasionally have post-lecture quizzes that will be open the entire day on Canvas for submission. We'll figure out how we want to do these quizzes when the time comes. Either they will involve printing some kind of a worksheet out and filling it out and then scanning it, or it will involve quiz questions on Canvas. Maybe it'll be a mixture of the two. And then, of course, we have the final 30%, remaining 30% for the course. So 40% for the midterms, 30% for the final, and 30% for homework and quizzes. The grade distribution, very similar to what you've seen in other courses. Above a 90 is some kind of an A, between a 90 and an 80 is some kind of B, on and on and on. So this is very standard uh, grading distribution. So the topics here, let's go over the topics. Well, 
You're going to be analyzing thermodynamic systems and determining properties for the systems. There are also relationships that relate properties. And what I mean by properties are things like temperature, pressure, volume, things that describe a system. We'll talk about systems as well here very soon. So we're going to be learning about properties and how they're related. We're going to be applying open and closed system conservation equations for mass, energy, and entropy. So I think you all know what mass is, obviously, what energy is. You probably don't know what entropy is, even though you've heard of it. But we're going to be looking at how mass, energy, and entropy are conserved. There are conservation equations that relate changes in energy, entropy, mass to various other parameters. Okay, so we're going to learn about these conservation equations. We're going to be learning about work producing devices, gasoline engines, diesel engines, jet engines. These cycle, these devices are idealized by various cycles, the auto cycle, the diesel cycle, the Brayton cycle. So we're going to be investigating work producing devices, cyclic devices, and what you learn will be relatable to gasoline engines, diesel engines, jet engines, and that also includes power plants, the power plant across the street. So we're going to be learning about devices that produce work of various kinds. We're also going to be looking at conversion devices, nozzles, diffusers, throttles. These are devices that don't produce or consume any work. They simply convert different forms of energy. So we're going to be learning about conversion devices. It's going to be learning about conversion devices. We're also going to be looking into detail, detail on various work producing devices such as power plants. We're going to look at the various components inside power plants, what they do, how they enhance the efficiency of power plants. We're going to look at the detail in detail on the devices within a gas turbine, a jet engine, and how each and every device works within the whole. So the class is going to start off typically looking at things in general, and then we're going to zoom down into the specifics as we delve deeper into each particular topic. There is a lot of material in this course, a lot of detail, and you are going to learn a lot in this course. We're also going to be learning about heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. If any of you are interested in things like humidity, relative humidity, absolute humidity, dew point, maybe these terms are known to you, or you're just in general eat, interested in heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, we're going to go over HVAC systems and do some simple preliminary design on simple HVAC, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning devices. We're also going to look at refrigeration devices. These are work-consuming devices or power-consuming devices. They take energy and they move heat around. Typically, they'll move heat out of a cold system. Your refrigerator has a device at the very base which operates on a refrigeration cycle. It extracts heat out of your ice box or your refrigerator and dumps it into your room that contains your refrigerator. So we'll talk about refrigeration systems as well. So we're going to look at work producing devices and we're going to look at work consuming devices. In this case, refrigeration devices. And then towards the end of the course, we're going to be looking at combustion as well. So we're going to look at combustion, in other words, furnaces, heat exchangers, that sort of thing. So we're going to be looking at chemical reactions. 
and see how energy is released when you oxidize or burn a fuel. So we're going to be looking at combustion, and that's towards the end of the course. So there is a lot in this course. I think that you will find that of all the courses you've taken at Virginia Tech so far, thermodynamics is probably going to be the most challenging, but you have the opportunity for learning the most interesting stuff. You will be able to analyze all sorts of devices that remain a mystery to the rest of mankind once you are done with thermodynamics course. Okay? I think it's a very rewarding course. I think you will find it very rewarding. Let's go over some of the policies here. You've got some prerequisites. You should look over the list of prerequisites here and make sure that you are current. Okay? Now, exams. So if you look on the very last page, I have a general list of topics per week. I don't have a detailed daily schedule, but I do have a weekly general schedule. And you'll see that the exams, the first exam and the second exam, the midterms are listed approximately a third of the way and two thirds of the way through the course. So we have two exams, two exams, We'll go over the details on that when the time comes. We also have quizzes, and these will typically cover lecture material. So either after the lecture, usually after the lecture, I will allow you a day to complete and submit a quiz. The quiz may still be timed, but you can do it any time during the day. We'll talk about, we'll go over the details on that when the time comes. So there will be quizzes. Homework again, we have homework. You learn thermodynamics by doing it, not just listening to me lecturing or reading it out of a textbook or your notes. You actually have to do it. You learn everything by being exposed to the concepts, seeing examples, and then doing the work yourself. So 25% or a quarter of your grade is based on the homework. So it's critical for you to get practice doing thermodynamics. Now, what happens if you, for whatever reason, cannot attend a lecture and therefore cannot do the quiz or you cannot do the quiz on time or you cannot attend a midterm or the final and you need to get a reschedule or you cannot submit a homework on time due to some sort of obligation. Well, we have a procedure for that. Let's go to the second item. The second item that is under administration in Canvas. This is your request for absence form. Let's go over how this works. So instead of you sending an email to me telling me about how you're gonna be absent on a particular day and requesting what to do. We have a system here. You have this form called the Request for Excused Absence Form, and it's for ME 2134. You must fill out this form and submit it to a web address, an email address, along with justificatory documentation. Let's go see how this form is actually arranged here. So if you are to miss a quiz or a homework assignment or a midterm or the final and you have justification for doing so, I don't mean you slept in, I don't mean you don't want to do it or feel like you can't do it and you're panicking. I mean if you have a legitimate excuse. Legitimate excuses are, oh, participation in an athletic event for Virginia Tech participation in a conference or attendance of a conference that conflicts with your time for taking the course. It could also include illness, but the illness must include some kind of a note or documentation. I do allow for bereavement, including weddings. So if you have to attend a funeral, you must provide documentation on that, either an airline ticket, or a copy of an obituary. 
If you're attending a wedding, I would like to see a copy of the wedding invitation attached. So I allow you to excuse yourself from courses, from coursework and the exams under restricted conditions without penalty. But you have to fill out this form and you have to submit it to a appropriate email. So you put your name, you put the date in which you're making the request for an absence. In other words, today's date. And then down here, you check whether you're going to miss a lecture, i.e. a quiz, a homework, or an exam. Then below that, you have the day in which you are expected to be absent, or days, plural. And then below that, you have to write out the reason for your absence. Athletic event, if you're on a team, design competition, if you're on a design team, conference, funeral, wedding, illness, and all of them have to include some kind of supporting documentation. You should write down what the documentation is, and you should attach the documentation to your submission. So I would fill out the request for absence form, print out your documentation, scan them together as a single document, and then submit them to the following Yahoo account, me2134instructors at yahoo.com. Send your filled out request for absence form along with your documentation to that email. Once a week, I will process it, and I will get back to you on whether you have been approved or not for your request for absence. If it's a planned absence, if it's a planned absence, i.e. a job interview, athletic events, something like that, I expect you to submit the request for absence one week ahead of time. If it's an unplanned absence, an illness, death in the family, all provided with some kind of documentation, then you need to submit a request for absence for the days that you missed no later than, what do I have here? I think I have a week after or something like that. Let's see. Yes, one week after the absence. So if it's a planned absence, you need to submit a request for absence form one week before you're going to be gone and miss the work. If it's an unplanned absence, typically an illness or something like that, or a death in the family, you need to submit a request for absence form no later than one week after the absence took place, okay? Okay, so let's go back to the syllabus here. Oops. So if you miss exams, quizzes, homework, you have to submit a request for absence form so we have documentation, okay? Grades we've already talked about. They're distributed between the quizzes, tests, homework, and the final. The honor system, you're all adults, you know about this. Just don't cheat, make the work your own. Don't copy somebody else's work. Don't go to some website and copy it down. A lot of the homework assignments I'm gonna give you are not going to be available on the internet. They will be uh, my own or other faculties custom uh, homework problems, and that same thing goes for the exams. Same thing goes for the exams. So I wouldn't spend a lot of time on the internet looking for this stuff. Let's go over the course schedule. So again, two text, the required text is uh, Moran and Shapiro's Fundamentals of Engineering Thermodynamics. If you can pick up an affordable copy, new or used, please do it. However, as far as I'm concerned, a copy of the course notes, which also includes all the property data, the technical data that you're gonna need to do problems, all that's included in the course notes, is just fine with me. The course notes is very affordable, $16, and you can pick up a copy of the course notes outside my office. There is a pile of them 
on the metal shelves. Topics, tentative course schedule. This week, we're going to start off with basic concepts and motivation. And then we're going to look at properties of pure substances. We're going to start the course off as easily as possible, starting with the basics. And we're going to look at properties of systems. What's the energy of a system? What's the enthalpy of a system? What's its pressure, temperature? So we're going to look at properties of pure substances. Okay, and then week two, we're going to continue on with the same thing, wrap up pure substances, properties of, and then week three, we're going to go into interactions, work, heat. We're going to define work and heat. I think you already know what work is from physics. We'll talk about heat. What is heat? Then we're going to move into the guts of the course or begin the guts of the course by investigating the energy balance. Hopefully you've already been introduced to the energy balance in basic physics. Work is equal to the change in total mechanical energy. So work is equal to WKE plus, I'm sorry, delta KE plus delta PE, kinetic and potential energy change. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. So we're going to move on to the energy balance. And then we're going to apply the energy balance to various kinds of systems and devices. You're going to learn about open and closed systems. Okay, there are different versions of the energy balance we're going to use depending on the device being analyzed. Then we have a, uh, we're going to move on into the second law of thermodynamics, which is all about entropy and efficiency. That's where things start getting really interesting when you get into entropy. For many of you, your brains are going to start curdling. Entropy is weird. You just have to accept it, get used to it, and one of these days you're going to wake up and it's going to make sense. Hopefully that will be this semester. You wake up and it will make sense. So we're going to start, uh, we're going to move into the second law and entropy around the first exam. And then we're going to look at the entropy balance, conservation of entropy, just like we look at conservation of energy. We're going to look at conservation of entropy. Entropy is a property just like pressure, just like temperature, just like energy, entropy is a property. Okay, so we're going to look at the entropy balance and apply it to various systems. Then we're going to look at work producing devices. Gasoline engines, diesel engines, jet engines, power plants. Okay, once we have the energy and the entropy balance, conservation of energy and entropy under our belt, we can move to serious analysis of somewhat complicated systems. Work producing devices like engines and power plants. And then we'll take, uh, after that's done, after we've looked in detail at work producing devices like engines and power plants, we're gonna move on to work consuming devices like refrigeration, refrigerators. Refrigerators are not about producing power, they're about moving heat. Typically moving heat from a cold place to a hot place. Okay, we'll talk more about heat in a few days, okay? In a, actually in a few weeks, we'll talk more about heat in a few weeks. So once we've gone over refrigeration, we're gonna go on to heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. That'll be fun. We can talk about how the AC system works in your refrigerator, in your uh, air conditioning, for your apartment, for the building you work in, wherever, in your car. And then we'll talk about heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. How to condition air and extract out excess moisture. How to heat up air. How comfortable does the air feel to be in, depending on the humidity and other things, okay? So we're gonna talk about HVAC, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, okay? 
And then we're going to finish off the semester with chemical reactions and reacting systems. Up to the last two weeks of course, we're not going to look at combustion. We're not going to look at things burning. We're not going to look at chemical reactions. We'll save that for the last two weeks of the course, okay? Last two weeks of the course. Okay, so I think we've gone over enough of the material here. Basic material for the course. So let's go through, let's switch out of this. Let's switch out of this. And let's go over a motivation for the course. Why are we taking thermodynamics? Why are we taking thermodynamics? So what's the motivation here? Motivation. Let's go over the motivation. Motivation. What's the motivation for the course? Well, let me write down the energy balance conservation of mechanical energy, as you learned it in your basic physics course. What you should have seen from physics is work is equal to the change in kinetic energy of a system plus the change in potential energy of the system. And remember this delta here means change. It's the Greek letter delta and it means change change. By the way, I haven't brought it up, but I have posted on Canvas under the miscellaneous folder. If you go to Canvas and under miscellaneous, you will see a list of Greek letters and what they are called. So for those of you that are a little bit rusty on your Greek letters, and we're going to be using a lot of Greek letters, a lot of Greek letters, uh, I have posted a list of Greek letters and their names. So delta or this triangle refers to change. So this is the energy balance if you like, what, from what you learned from physics. This is um, conservation of mechanical, mechanical energy, mechanical energy, okay? Conservation of mechanical energy. You learned that from physics. You learned that from physics. Okay, now I am going to apply this energy balance here, conservation of mechanical energy, to a very simple situation. And I'm going to show you that this equation, although it's very useful for many systems, is not the end of the story. This equation, under certain conditions, is true, but is not the whole story. It's incomplete. It's incomplete. Okay, so let's say I have the following system. I have a table. So here's our table. And on this table is an object. Okay. Maybe it's the eraser. Okay. Maybe this is a tabletop and the eraser is on the top. So this is our table and this is some sort of mass. I don't know. It might be my eraser. Might be my eraser. All right. So this mass has a velocity VEL1. VEL1. Okay. Has a velocity VEL1. It also has a mass. A mass one or I'll call it just M, M for mass, okay? Now, originally, I'm gonna call this state number one. This is state number one. This mass is moving along the top of this table. This mass has a velocity VEL1. And if I stick a thermometer on the table and the mass at state one, or if you like at time one. Instead of thinking about state, let's think about it in terms of time. Time one. If I stick a thermometer here and I measure the thermometer, I will get a temperature T1. Temperature T1. So this T1 
table mass system has a temperature T1 at state one or time one, if you like. Okay. Now this mass is moving along and there is some friction. There is some friction going on here. Some friction going on between the moving eraser or mass, moving eraser or mass on the top of my table. So what's going to happen to that moving mass or eraser if I wait long enough in time? If I wait long enough, the mass is going to stop due to friction and come to rest. So I will get to state two if I wait long enough in which the mass has moved and now stopped. So here's my table and now my mass is over here. Okay, and it's stationary. So velocity VEL2 is zero. Okay, the mass has stopped. Mass stops. Due to friction, friction between the table and the mass has caused the mass to stop moving. Okay? So its final velocity is zero, its initial velocity is not zero, it's VEL1, okay? VEL1 is not zero, greater than zero, okay? VEL1 is greater than zero, all right? So I got my mass, I got my table at state two, okay? Let's apply the energy balance to my table mass system. I'm going to put a little control volume surrounding my table mass system. I'm just going to look at the table mass system. Okay? And I'm going to apply the energy balance. Which energy balance am I going to apply? Conservation of mechanical energy, just like you learned in basic physics. Okay, let's apply conservation of energy to our table mass or table eraser system. Let's see here. So, work is equal to the change in kinetic energy from state one to state two. One arrow two, delta Ke from state one to state two, plus delta Pe from state one to state two. Okay? By the way, this should also be the work done on the system from state one to state two. Okay, so so far we're just doing a simple physics problem and applying conservation of mechanical energy. Okay? Now let's expand these terms here. The potential energy change, that's gonna be PE2 minus PE1. That's what the delta PE1 to two refers to. The delta KE term, that's gonna be KE2 minus KE1. That's our change in kinetic energy. Kinetic energy at state two minus kinetic energy at state one. Okay. Now let's start from the left. Let's start on the left hand side and attack this equation and see what conservation mechanical energy tells us about what's going on with the system. Very simple problem. Now notice that nothing is reaching in and moving anything. In other words, nobody is reaching in and pushing the mass. The mass is already moving at state one. The mass is already moving at state one. So nobody's reaching in and pushing anything. No work is being done. No work is being transferred across the system boundary. So work is going to be equal to zero from state one to state two. Okay. 
What about the potential energy term? Delta PE, let's start on the right hand side. Potential energy has to do with the height of the system. It's work against gravity. Well, I don't see any height change here. It's just a table and a piece of material is moved. A mass is moved from the left to the right and stopped. There's no change in height going on. So this term here is zero, okay? So delta PE is zero. That whole term is zero, the whole term. The whole term is zero. So let's write what I got. I got zero equals delta KE from state one to state two, which is KE2 minus KE1, okay? Now kinetic energy is one half mv squared. So the kinetic energy So what's got kinetic energy in the system? It's the mass that has kinetic energy. So at state one, the kinetic energy is only with the moving mass. So I have one half m velocity one squared. So the mass here is the only thing that's moving in the system. So the kinetic energy of the system at state one is equal to the kinetic energy of the mass, which is one half velocity one squared. Any kinetic energy in state two? The mass isn't moving and the table isn't moving. I guess we're assuming the table's not moving. So no, there's no kinetic energy in state two. Everything has stopped moving. Let's write down what we've got. We've applied conservation of mechanical energy to a very simple system. And let's write what I got. I got zero is equal to, I guess I'll go out here. I think I can do the whole thing. There we go. I'll zoom back in in just a moment so you can see. So I have zero on the left is equal to minus KE1. I got zero is equal to minus KE1, which is minus one half mass velocity one squared. Okay. Now, velocity one, what the world is velocity one? It's greater than zero, so the mass is moving from left to right, so velocity one is positive, greater than zero. But this equation, this equation says that all this has got to be equal to zero. The mass isn't zero, so this implies velocity one has to equal zero. What? Velocity one has to be equal to zero according to conservation of energy, mechanical energy. That's not right. That's not right. No, the mass starts off at positive velocity. It's not equal to zero. So we have a contradiction. Contradiction. Oops. Diction. Contradiction. We assume conservation of mechanical energy applied it to a very simple situation and it fails. It fails, big time. What is wrong? What is wrong? Well, 
let's go back to our simple situation here. At state one, we measure the temperature of the table and the, and the mass. And we find that it's got a temperature T1. Maybe it's room temperature, who knows? And then once the mass stops, I again take the temperature of the table mass system. I stick a thermometer right here and I find out that the temperature has gone up. I have a temperature T2, which is greater than T1. In other words, in other words, the table mass system gets warmer. Table mass system warms up. Table mass system warms up. In other words, T2 is greater than T1, okay? So what this means is there's some kind of energy that is associated with temperature. We're missing some kind of energy that isn't kinetic, it isn't potential, it's an internal energy. It's energy that is stored in the mass of the system and it's got something to do with temperature. So let's rewrite Let's rewrite our conservation of energy equation. Let's rewrite conservation of energy. So we're missing some energy. Missing a form of energy. And we're going to call this new form of energy internal energy. Internal energy. Internal energy. And it's going to have a symbol U. And it is a function of temperature and maybe some other stuff. Function of temp. Function of temperature. I can't read that. Function of temperature and maybe some other stuff. We'll talk about that later. So let's write our new energy balance. Work equals change in kinetic plus change in potential plus change in internal energy U. Internal energy U. We got a new term, a new kind of energy Q, U. New kind of energy, internal energy, all right? And it's got to do with temperature, something to do with temperature. Simple experiment shows us that has to be the case, okay? I think, uh, tell you what, I'm gonna, just so we don't have a break here, I'm just gonna write delta U, that looks better, delta U. So this guy is the change in internal energy. Change in internal energy, okay? change in internal energy. Delta, that's what the delta refers to in that equation, okay? All right, guess what? This equation is better, but it's still got problems. Still got problems. Let's see what these problems are. Let's see what these problems are. We'll get into a very simple system. We'll do
do a process involving a very simple system. Let's say we have two bars. So this is state one again. And we have two bars and they are in thermal contact with each other. So we got two bars and they're in contact, physical or thermal if you like, contact. We got bar A and bar B. Bar A is hot and has a temperature. I guess I'll move this stuff around. A and it is hot. And it's got a temperature at state one, T sub A one. At state one, the top bar is hot and the bottom bar is cold. And they are contacting each other. So B is cold and it's state one or time one if you like, T B one. So bar, the bottom bar has temperature TB1. And remember, this is the hot one and this is the cold one. So what we're saying is TA at state one is greater than TB at state one. Okay, this guy's hot. Bar A is hot. Okay. Now what's gonna happen if we sit around and wait for these bars to do their thing over time. Let's say we wait a long time. These bars are contacting each other. They're in thermal contact with each other. We got a hot bar, we got a cold bar. What's gonna happen? Well, what's gonna happen is the hot bar is gonna cool down and the cold bar is gonna heat up and they will come to some mutual temperature. So it's state two. Here's our two bars, A, temperature TA at state two, and then we have bar B at temperature TB state two, and they're both gonna be warm. They're both gonna be warm. The hot bar will get cooler, and the cool bar will get warmer. And this will happen, and what we'll find is the temperatures of the bars will be the same at state two, the final state. So TA2 will be equal to TB2. Same temp. Same temp. Hot bar, cold bar, you wait long enough, they're in physical contact, the thermal contact with each other, and they become the same temperature over time, okay? Now, let's apply our energy balance over here. Let's apply our energy balance. This guy, the one that's modified with the internal energy term. We know we had to add it, to take into account a simple situation involving friction, the sliding mass on the table. So we have this internal energy term. Let's apply this equation to a piece or one of our blocks. Let's make this our system, just one of the blocks. Let's make A our system. Okay. Let's make A our system. I could do it with B, but I'm going to do it with A. The result's going to be the same. Let's apply the energy balance. Work from state one to state two, and this is for the A bar system, the one that was originally hot and becomes warm. Let's see here, uh, is equal to change in kinetic, from one to two, plus change in potential energy, one to two, 
plus change in internal energy, one to two. Now, nothing is reaching in and pushing on any of these bars, including A. Nothing's shaking it around, nothing's moving it, so there's no work going on. No work, so that's gone. The bar is not moving, neither of them are moving, they don't speed up or slow down. There's no indication that these bars are moving or they're changing velocity. So there's no change in kinetic energy for bar A or any of the bars. Same thing with potential energy. The bars aren't moving or changing positions, so there can't be a change in height. So there's no change in potential energy of the bar. That's gone too. So this implies zero is equal to delta U from one to two, okay? Now, internal energy is a function of temperature and some other stuff. Let's just focus on the temperature part. This delta U means U2 minus U, U at state two minus U at state one. And remember that's for the originally hot bar, okay? The top, the top bar. It's in physical contact with the cold bar on the bottom. So it says for the top bar, it's internal energy change U2 minus U1 is equal to zero. What does this imply? This implies U2 is equal to U1. Okay. Now U2 is U evaluated at temperature T, B, T, A, 2. So U2 is internal energy evaluated at T, A, 2. Internal energy is a function of temperature. Internal energy is a function of temperature. So U2 is U evaluated at temperature T, A, 2. U1, is internal energy evaluated at temperature TA1. Okay. If these are equal, that means these temperatures have to be equal. Uh-oh. TA2 equal TA1. Let's put a box around that and an explanation point and a question mark and an explanation point and a question mark. So this is saying that the original temperature of the hot bar is equal to the final temperature of the hot bar. But that's not right. It starts off hot, TA1, and then it becomes warm. So presumably, presumably TA1 is greater than TA2 because we start with a hot and we go to a warm bar. So this doesn't make any sense. This claims that the temperature of the hot bar won't change if we apply conservation of mechanical energy. Applying conservation of mechanical energy to the hot bar says that over time, it will never cool down. The temperature, the final temperature and the initial temperature are the same. That's not right. We know everything we know about physical reality says that hot things eventually cool back down. If you leave them alone, they cool down to room temperature, they cool down to some steady state temperature. Conservation of mechanical energy, conservation of mechanical energy says that things don't cool down. That's not right. That's not right. So what's the answer? 
The answer is there is another form of energy transfer. Work is an energy transfer. It's a means of doing, of increasing the energy of the system by doing mechanical work. There is another form of energy transfer, and it's called heat Q. Q equals non-mechanical energy transfer from hot to cold. Cold. Q is a non-mechanical energy transfer from hot to cold, and it's called, quote, heat transfer. This guy, Q, is called heat transfer. It's a non-mechanical transfer of energy. So this guy here is heat heat transfer. If you add that term in Q into your energy balance, then you'll find that heat flows from the hot to the cold bar until the temperatures are the same. So we have heat transfer Q from the hot bar to the cold bar, and the energy equation will work out just fine. You'll get that the change in internal energy is equal to the heat transfer. Back up here, instead of there being a zero over here, you'll have a Q, and you'll get that the heat transfer is equal to the change in internal energy of the upper bar. That's fine. So to explain these simple phenomena that you see here. Hot things go get cooler if you wait. Cold things get warmer if you wait. You have to incorporate the idea of heat transfer Q. Heat transfer Q, okay? All right, let's do one last thing. Let's do one last thing. We're going to apply this to one more system. One more system. Let's look at one more situation and apply and apply our energy balance. Let's say we have a device. Device. Some kind of device or machine. A device or a machine. And let's say this device receives a certain amount of heat Q and produces a certain amount of work, W. Okay, so the claim is here is it takes heat transfer, energy in the form of heat, and produces work. The arrows mean the heat is being added to the system, and the arrow here indicates that work is being done by the system. It's flowing out. Energy is flowing out of the system in the form of mechanical work. Okay, it's producing some kind of power. Now let's say that during this process here, during this process, there's no change in kinetic, potential, or internal energy of my device. The device doesn't change its position, its velocity, or its temperature. Everything about the device stays the same, but it apparently receives heat and produces work. Let's apply the energy balance to 
our device. Okay. Q minus W is equal to delta PE plus delta KE plus delta U. Okay, that's our full energy balance that we do, essentially derived. We started with conservation of mechanical energy, did some very simple rudimentary experiments and realized we were missing an internal energy and a heat transfer. I'm sorry, this is a plus. Okay, sorry about that. Bit of a typo on my, my part. So we got our new energy balance with these two terms that are used to predict and explain simple phenomena that the old conservation of mechanical energy couldn't. The old conservation of mechanical energy was just W is equal to delta P plus delta KE. That didn't work for some simple stuff. Let's apply the energy balance to our machine or device that receives heat and produces work. No change in kinetic and potential energy or internal energy. That's what we're assuming. And what I get is Q is equal to work or just flipping things around, work is equal to heat transfer. All the energy that gets transferred into the device gets converted into work. Work is equal to Q. Q gets transformed into work for this device. Guess what? Such a device as this has never been built. And there are good, very convincing, dare I say unchallengeable, perhaps, theoretical reasons why the device will never be built. There is no device that takes heat and produces the equivalent amount of work. This equation says work is equal to heat when we apply the energy balance. No device has ever been built. So I'm gonna write here, not possible. Not possible. Work is not equivalent to heat. In fact, I'm going to write that right over here. So Q is equal to heat transfer. And by the way, it is found that work W not equivalent not equivalent, oops, or equal, I'll just say equal to heat to heat. Work, work, W, not equivalent to heat, not equivalent to heat. So on the energy balance, so that means in the energy balance, Q plus W is equal to delta KE, plus delta PE plus delta U. These guys are not the same. They're on the left-hand side of the energy balance, but they're not the same. Not the same. Even though the energy balance kind of sort of implies that they are. They both are on the left-hand side of the equation. They occur for different reasons. One is a mechanical transfer of energy, and one is a heat transfer of energy. But the energy balance says they're the same. 
And you will see later on, when we get into enthalpy, cannot build a device that converts heat into work, 100%. Cannot convert an amount of heat Q into the equivalent amount of work W, not possible. That means that the energy balance, while it's complete in terms of energy, is not the end of the story. There's another property called entropy. Another property called entropy, and it has its own balance, and it will explain why we can't build these kinds of devices. A device of 100% efficiency is not possible. Okay? Okay, I hope I have, uh, I hope I've whetted your appetite here on where we're going to be going with this course. We're going to start off, well, we started off with the energy balance, conservation of mechanical energy from high school, basically, and then we've added two terms in, internal energy and heat transfer, and we have a Final conservation of energy equation. I'll put a little box around it. Put a little box around it. That's the final form of the energy equation as far as we're concerned. And we're going to be applying this equation to various devices as we go along with the semester. Okay? All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think that's it for today. We will resume this next time and start defining some of the concepts and terminology used for the course. We'll talk about what a system is, what kinds of systems are they, they are, what a process is, what a state is, what a property is. We'll spend a little time next lecture talking about those basics. And then we're gonna move on into the material next time and we're gonna look at properties of pure substances properties of pure substances. Take care, ladies and gentlemen.